Rebecca, how's uh, Module 5 coming along and catching up? Oh, nice. Yeah, you were going crazy the last two days working. Me? Yeah. <laughs> now, all of a sudden, I just noticed like a flurry of activity. Everything will be tonight. Take your time. The so next, not, yeah. the next module is really short too. And then I'm not going to be able to follow the module at all. Well, it's an online class, so you just got to figure that out on your own. Mm -hmm. I'll make sure you don't get assigned to teach the module that you're away. Because you guys are going to start teaching. Why is this broadcasting? So fluency. Who can remind me what fluency is? Great and Have I heard the third thing? Prosody. Prosody is clue. Yeah, prosody is a. For those who don't know the term prosody, it's one of my favorite words. Um, it's the cadence and beats of reading. It's a farm from poetry, but um, and we talk about it with fluency. But basically, fluency is speed, accuracy, and emotion. Those are the three things that we're looking at: accuracy, speed, and expression. Because when you start to read, right before you really start working on your readiness for fluency, and this is kind of where the kindergartners would be. It's a very halt to be read. They have to really basically apply their phonics to every single word they come across. It's slow. It's word for word, so they're really not, they're putting most of their energy in the meat. They're uncertain specific sight words. My notes is real colorful. They totally ignore punctuation, which helps with expression. And what happens, and it happens very quickly, is that they memorize the books. Or they use the pictures to figure out what words should be there. So these are the kinds of kids that would be ready for lessons and instruction in fluency. Um, for collaborative and special ed majors, this is probably a lot of review. Basically, when we measure fluency, we're talking about the number of words in the text read correctly per minute. Take a guess. How many should a first grader read? If you know, don't say anything. Take a guess, folks. First grader. Like out of 100 or something? And a minute. Oh, and a minute. 100 words? 30 words? 50? 50 words? Yeah. 50 to 65 words per minute in first grade. 90 to 100 in um, second grade. And by the time you reach uh, up to sixth grade, you're looking at 145 to 155 words a minute per plus. But that's, that's when the textual demands start to change how your fluency. And I won't be asking you that specifically, so, you know. I never try to put on something on a test that you can just look up or that doesn't really matter. Um, there would always be a chart when you get an assessment on that. So how do we teach fluency? I say this all the time when I assign the Literacy Center's assignment in 307, mainly because they haven't had this class yet, so they don't really know. But silent reading or independent reading does nothing for fluency. We know this. You need guided or shared reading practices to improve fluency. And just having kids read does nothing for fluency. They're reading out loud. If they're reading silently, it doesn't do anything. And if they're at a stage to where they're reading independently, silently to themselves, they're probably not doing fluency interventions. They're focusing now on meaning making. Fluency is the bridge 
between phonics and comprehension. So if they've reached that stage, then you're probably not working on that level yet. However, if you're noticing that, you okay? Um, if you notice, for example, that your kids might be struggling with comprehension, you might give a diagnostic assessment of fluency. And you notice, oh, wait a minute, and because basically, then after you realize, after that, you know, they might go and test and see if are they, you know, having trouble with their phonics or their decoding. Whereas, you know, you're always trying to figure out where the breakdown is. So we're going to go through a couple of traditional practices. Often you'll hear the round robin. Um, students take turns reading a text out loud. Not best practice. Why? See it in science class and social studies as leaders classes, chapter books. Why may not why may round robin reading not be a great practice? Yeah, you have paragraph one, you have paragraph two, your, your first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. You know I make everybody read one paragraph. You can't wait count to the seventh paragraph and you just zone out till we get there. I did it all the time in school. Yes, ma'am? I feel like it also kind of builds on the anxiety. Yeah. So instead I use things like choral reading, close reading, close reading, and partner reading. Supposed to be, no, it's not supposed to be this. Close reading is something totally different. Close activities involve, well, I'll get to that slide in a second. Court reading, all, reading all together and aloud. That's the non threatening part that you're talking about, how sometimes Brown Robin can provide some anxious issues. But you're reading with the students at the same time. You're reading at a moderate rate. And you're doing things to kind of prime them. All right, children, keep your voice with me. OK, let's look for their periods and watch how I stop. We call it kind of pre-correcting. You know what kind of mistakes that they're going to make. Now. This is closed reading. Closed reading is basically where you skip certain words and you want the kids to jump in with those words. If you've ever seen Read 180, they do this where the, the kids are supposed to read the last word of every sentence. Um, but you orally read the materials to the students and you pause them and fill in. However, it does not have to be like so lame and boring. You, like, it happens automatically. If you've ever read to a kid, like a six-year-old, who has a favorite book, and gosh forbid you read one of the words that they know, they might get so mad. So you can like build up anticipation as you get near the word. Um, so it doesn't have to be like this dry, I'm going to just, you're going to read every last word of the sentence. You can also intentionally delete meaningful words that, that affect the meaning of that sentence. So they have to focus in on it. And what would be the purpose of deleting the meaningful words? Because um, that provides them um, with semantic clues, not just having to code the word to what it, the word would be, because it's c connected to the meaning of the text. Um, and it also gives them the chance to focus in on um, following along with you at that pace. I mean, who really have to define it? It's reading with a partner. Um, 
I use it quite often. And you assign partners, and they're usually level. So there's a, you know, a beginning reader, but you never ever partner the top readers with the low readers. That does nothing for either student. So you want students to be have slightly different fluency rates, but close together, so that they can really learn from each other. And as a teacher, you don't decide all the classes. You're probably working with your four students that need you the most. So you probably grab like five kids, go to the reading center in the back of the room, and have the rest of the kids read with partners. Like, and there's specific books that we always use for um, fluency, like Chicka Chicka Boom Boom and Click Clack Moo. And there's specific titles that are used over and over again for fluency. So you might have your kids reading Click Clack Boom as a play, um, while you're working with another group of students. So, when is one student recognizes who you, we use Asset. Can you really, can you, <coughs> this video may not make it to YouTube. Um, <laughs> You know, can you figure out this word? And if they can't, then it's, well, this is what this word is. So that's why you try to pair students, but you don't want to pair the, the highest with the lowest. Nobody wins in that situation, ever. Um, partner reading, there's a couple ways you can do it. Side by side, shoulder to shoulder. And reading with the partner. So it's side by side for partners to sit next to each other. So it's my turn to read. I'm going through reading and pointing, and it's your turn. If it was shoulder to shoulder, we're back to back, each with our own book. And we're trying to stay on point together. And then reading with the partner, I'll do the pointing, you do the reading, and then you do the pointing, I do the reading. All of them are very effective practices. Way more effective than round robin. No, they take turns, but you're doing the pointing and the reading. In reading with the partner, one person's pointing while the other one reads. So you're pointing, we're both reading. And I'm pointing, we're both reading. I'm sorry, that's a little. So, so this, this is the third one? Yeah. So the first one. I think I had to add a fourth category because I like when one person points and reads, and then, or I point, you read, you point, I read. I'll have to add another one. And when you have to work with a small group of students on fluency, this is a great thing to do. And we're talking first, second grade, maybe occasionally third and fourth grade, though, you're doing that during. Um, those might be students when we talk about response to intervention. Um, they might need they might need to work on their fluency, so you might be working with them during that block of time on fluency. But as, as far as like whole class fluency lessons go, they're usually winding down by the end of second grade, middle of third grade. But you always are focusing on emotion. It's just I guess they evolve. It's not you know it's not as much as the rate. The other option is to do the follow model program. And this is where you have the book on tape, where they're, or back to, you know, choral reading, the teacher's model. 
but you don't you can do that with small groups too. Then that'd be a whole class. Choral reading usually refers to the whole class. But a lot of fluency centers just have books on tape. And even if the kids aren't reading with the book, it's having it in front of them reading while the tape is playing. That helps build fluency. Alright. Now, we're going to transition out to assessing fluency. And that's running records. Have you guys done running records yet before 35? I'm sure you're going to get there. And you're in 435 now? We might have, I'm not sure. What class are you in now? 435. Oh, okay. Maybe you don't get there. All right. Running records. Something that you probably all end up having to do as elementary school teachers. Um, for my 318s, you're not going to ever do a running record. Oh, well, I shouldn't say that because you can teach second or third grade, first grade. I keep thinking, you know, so many of you expressed an interest in just teaching preschool. But your certification, if you end up in kindergarten, first, second grade, third grade, usually we're not doing them in kindergarten unless, I mean, who knows like the, what they're pushing on kindergartens nowadays, but you know, they, they do start in earnest in first, second, third grade. I see the DRA too go all the way up to like sixth graders, seventh graders, which is a kind of a variation. Run records. We're going to talk about what a running record is, how you score, our queuing systems. I told you they would come back to haunt you and that they are involved throughout the whole program. Um, basically, a running record. Well, some of you guys tell me what's a running record? Does anyone know? Anyone seen one done in their field observations? Tanya? Well, you teach, so you've probably seen them. Um, the teacher and the student usually go where there's no distractions. The student will read. Um, the teacher checks off notes as they're reading to make sure that they're reading correctly, makes a correction. They may say it instead of the other mark. What would the kid say? That's the miscue. It's a miscue analysis. You're analyzing the mistakes that students make. <laughs> so. We've talked about our queuing systems all semester long. Our semantic cues, our syntactic cues, and our graphophonic cues. And with meaning, we're basically looking at the pictures because a lot of the writing record books will have pictures. Does it? Does what? Does the mistake? Does well? This is well, now we're talking miscue analysis. Does the miscue mis make sense in context? Does the miscue sound correct grammatically? Or does it look visually or sound right phonetically, like they just read the, you know, the word wrong, like peach, like patch? And the cubing systems, I mean, we started our first class kind of with those. So <coughs> they should not be new to anybody. So we read the text. Yesterday I walked the dog. Student read. Yesterday was the dog. Does that make sense? No. Do you expect to see coming to those letters? Are they the same like beginning sounds? Yeah, so it's a graphophonic mistake. Yesterday I saw the dog. Visual, does it look right? Yeah, I mean the sentence is correct. Expect to see that? Not really. Yesterday I walked the dog. Structure is incorrect. 
And we're going to spend all day Monday looking at video examples of running records in small groups. So you'll understand this a little bit more. I'm just trying to give you guys the contextual information now. Um, basically, all this means is it's that big three-part Venn diagram. They don't work alone. You don't have to write this word for word. You already drew the Venn diagram. But good readers use all of those systems together to figure out the words. So when we do the running records, we're looking for diagnostic information. We want to know what the reader can do. What occurs as they read, and how do they change over time. We do running records often to give us qualitative and quantitative growth in students as readers. Sidebar question. Um, I want to, when is the next, when is the December um, FOR test? 19th. What? 5th of December? What are the best days for study sessions? Do we want Saturdays? Do we want like weekdays? How about, when do people work most on weekends? I mean, if you just, you're hungover and you don't want to come, I, I don't care. I mean, if but people have, like, work or life or children and, and weekdays and weekends don't work, um, what are, like, the most commonly free times uh, that people have classes, though? What? I'm not doing it after class. Uh, I, I have to get home, really. I can't. Tuesday, like, is there, like, a block, like, university-wide time that people are usually free? Yeah, you guys, nobody, you don't have education class on Fridays. Most of you should be pretty wrapped up in your second majors, right? What? All right, so I will try to tentatively plan a couple for some Fridays um, later this month. They're optional and I'll record them all. They're not required. In no way affect your grades. You won't, you won't get bonus points. Don't do anything like that. Make sure you're doing your readings. You know, help you prepare. Um, you're supposed to read chapter four and six for today. Um, I don't think I'm gonna check notes today, but I'll grab them on Wednesday. What? Monday. Then. I just said Monday then. So how do you do? First, you choose a book or a text. Usually, these are pre chosen for you. It's up to your, your school bought the whatever book you're going to use, and it's leveled for the students. You introduce the book, you go to the cover, you kind of, you know, you do all that little stuff with them. It's got to be an unknown text. As I said, children quickly memorize books. That's why the books are leveled, per se, because you can't do pre and post with the same book. You record all the miscues, and I'll show you what that looks like on... Monday, a little bit today. Then the hard part comes. 
You have to write these reports for 20-something chairs in your classroom. And this will be kind of that, like, brief report is what will be the essay question on your quiz. So, if it's an accurate reading, you give a check for every word. Now, the running record sheets are this blank. I'm not, I just, I can't work that way. I mean, when you see, like, skilled people do it, they're so fast. I've never been that fast at this. I can't lie. Um, I like having a photocopy of the book and putting the words letters right on the book. But I'll also show you an iPad app that I like, too, that is just a blank sheet. If it's a substitution, you put a line over the word, and you put whatever word they said instead of the word. So if the text said wants, you put a line of the word and you write went. Because that's what the kid said. If they repeated it, put an R. Self-correction, you just put the SC after the mistake. No, they self-corrected. You will need to have these memorized for the test. And we'll be like, just everyone mistakes. For our test or for the chemistry? For our test. I'm not told to peel and try that again. I just, an omission is just a line over. And assertion is a line under with the word that was added. Two words? Yeah, like a. If they put a word in that wasn't there. Oh. So it means the word, word no, no, a mission. Yeah, if they left out a word, it's a mission. If they put a word that was not in the text, that's insertion. Okay. I'm gonna. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I thought, I thought I went back and added all just the PowerPoints. The last one I checked. Oh, then shoot. I'll have to double check and add them all. Sorry to be sitting down. I'm just kind of hurt. So you count them as errors. But repetitions are not counted as errors. And self-corrections are not counted as errors. What? Can I what? No. Because when I give you the sheet, I will have the number of errors on it. <laughs> so you don't even have to write this down. Really. So to determine the accuracy rate, if there are 71 words in the text, and they had five errors, then it means they read 66 correctly. Then you take 66 divided by 71, and that's, you know, multiplied by 93. And you multiply it 100. And if they score 95 or above, that means that text is at their independent level. If you do 90 to 94 percent, that's at their instructional level. If it's 89 percent, that means it was at their difficult level. So this quiz is basically just a more intense, like, chord maze comprehension. Is that the idea? Yeah, the chord, you basically, the chord maze, if I, I don't want to misconstrue because I'm not looking at it, but I think that does involve some running records, some risky analysis. We'll, we'll look at a lot more on Monday, too.
So I like to see the students ride ponies at the farm. The text read, I like to see horses at the farm. You don't really have to write most of this down. There are, there are pictures of horses and colts on the page, so that means the message is almost the same. It's not visually similar, but it's an acceptable language structure. So that means it was a semantic mistake. Because it made sense, it wasn't graphophonic. So they were using the clues in the text. But if they said, I like to see here's at the farm, here's where it's not acceptable sentence. Substitution looks similar, so here it's kind of a graphophonic mistake. Syntactic mistake. Um, so let's look at a quick example. It'll make it'll be a lot more clear on Monday. I just wanted to give you guys the basis.